Good morning. Happy Wednesday. I have no coffee in hand and it is perfect. All right. So today is Wednesday. That means tomorrow is Thursday, which means 6 a.m. Tomorrow morning, the coffee and coaches conference call as usual. I believe if you're keeping count, we're upwards of, of 72. I'm not even sure when I started counting, but we've been doing these things for a while. They get better and better every week. Enjoying these calls thoroughly. Please join us at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. The link will be on my professional Facebook page just prior to the call. Okay, today's Q&A. I had two questions. This is really weird. Robert and Rory both asked about uh, shoulder impingement. And so I'm going to kind of combine their question into one. And it goes along the lines of, um, is shoulder impingement associated with rotator cuff weakness and in putting pressure against the acromion? So, so let's break this down a little bit. I don't think that we can necessarily say that there is an intrinsic weakness in any musculature under these circumstances. What we're looking at are mechanical relationships that allow us to boost force in certain positions. So this goes back to shape change and position. And so if mechanically we can't produce these, these positions that do allow us to boost force, then it may test weak in certain positions based on how we perceive these things, how we are measured. And so if you're an old school uh, manual muscle tester, you might say, oh, you're weak in this position and you can go ahead and blame a certain muscle for that, which is probably untrue. Again, it's probably a relationship uh, problem that you're looking at. Secondly, I think that we probably need to start telling ourselves a new story in regards to some of the uh, the so-called impingement tests. And so if we're going to pick on one, let's pick on near for a second because we've got some, some decent uh, research on that. So the nearest test is where we're reaching above shoulder level and we get the, uh, the shoulder pain. And traditionally it was thought that, oh, you're just um, impinging the rotator cuff against the acromion. Um, if, you look at, if you look at some of the available research, it's not really happening. So we get above that, that uh, shoulder level reach um, and some people will say, well, you're probably approaching 120 degrees of traditional shoulder flexion, and then that's where you get symptomatic. Um, if we look at this, they've looked at these things internally, and there is no impingement of the rotator cuff um, musculature against the acromion in that position. What they did find was that there is some compression against the superior aspect of the glenoid, which would be concentric orientation or compression, if you will. And so what I think that we're, we're looking at here, um, Robert and Rory, is we're looking at this, the influence of the superficial compressive strategies, limiting the shape change, limiting, limiting our ability to position ourselves to create spaces to move into. So for instance, if I had a posterior lower compressive strategy in the thorax, as I start to elevate my arm, um, where I would typically think that I have access to space, I'm probably moving into uh, a place where I'm superimposing intra rotation against the external rotation very, very quickly, and then I'm just running out of space. And so wherever that would show up, whether it be the Hawkins Kennedy at about 90 degrees of shoulder elevation, whether you would see the painful arc, or whether you would see the, the positive and test. So those three impingements that I've talked about in the past are all associated with different areas of compression in the thorax. So I think that's probably a better story to be able to use because as we alleviate those areas of compression, we see the restoration of ranges of motion and we see a reduction or elimination of those so-called impingement um, symptoms. So we probably need a new word for impingement because that's probably not really happening. Um, we could just say pain if we wanted to, I suppose. That might be the easiest way to do this rather than trying to blame something on, on structure. So guys, I hope that, that uh, uh, helps you in that respect. What I'm gonna do is like, I'm gonna attach the, uh, the three impingements video, which I think is, is still useful for a lot of folks and, and many people haven't seen it yet, um, where I talked about the, the areas of compression that you're gonna see that are associated with these specific impingement tests. So, so again, should be useful for a lot of folks. Um, if you would like to participate in a 15-minute consultation, please go to askbillhartman at gmail.com, askbillhartman at gmail.com. Put 15-minute consultation in the subject line so don't delete it, and we'll arrange that at our mutual convenience. Everybody have an outstanding Wednesday. I will see you tomorrow morning, 6 a.m., Coffee and Coaches Conference Call. Have a great day. So this is from Mihail. And Mihail says, hey, Bill. Hey, Mihail. So during shoulder flexion test, when measuring it the right way, so he's making reference to my YouTube video on how to measure shoulder flexion. 
Um, he says, what's happening when the elbow starts to move laterally? Is there no more motion available at the shoulder girdle? And the only way to get the arm overhead is through shoulder internal rotation. So if you keep raising the arm overhead while allowing the internal rotation to happen, is movement happening only at the shoulder joint with no movement at the scap, clavicle, etc.? Mihail, you are on point. So, so this is a very, very specific situation where we've got a posterior compressive strategy that is gonna limit shoulder um, elevation because it's gonna eliminate the external rotation element of, of elevation. The minute you steal that, you're diving right into internal rotation and you're moving towards internal rotation, but we've got a scapula that can't move. And so we have a very specific limitation and you start banging into the compressive strategy at about 90 degrees of shoulder flexion, which would typically be one of our impingement tests. So what I would like to do, Mihail, is I would like to take this situation and let us look at three different impingements because I think a lot of impingement gets gets um, packaged into one thing and I, and I think the current strategies for most uh, PTs is to try to look at um, they're, they're calling it subacromial pain syndrome um, rather than subacromial impingement I, I, we don't want to look at these impingements the same because the source of the limitation that is creating the compressive strategy in the shoulder that results in pain is not the same so we're going to look at three different situations here and we get to use old school, uh, PT school, orthopedic textbook impingement tests because this is why those impingement tests were valuable at one point in time. They just didn't know why, so we're gonna tell you why here. So we're gonna look at Hawkins Kennedy, we're gonna look at the near test, and then we'll look at a painful arc, okay? Now, I don't use these tests because my table tests will tell me exactly where these compressive strategies are. Just because somebody doesn't have pain with, with these, these positions, it doesn't mean that there's not a compressive strategy there. It just means that it's not sensitized, so everybody kind of ignores it. Um, and then when somebody does have pain, they tend to blame the poor little rotator cuff. It's not his fault. He's just the result. And so let's talk about where this compressive stuff comes from, okay? So let's go Hawkins Kennedy first. So Hawkins Kennedy is, is that, that test at about 90 degrees of shoulder flexion where they drive into rotation and, and you always get that wincy face on everybody there, okay? And so what this is, this is caused by a limitation in shoulder flexion below 90 degrees. So this is a posterior lower compression that steals the early phase of external rotation of, of arm elevation. So um, again, go to YouTube and check out my shoulder flexion video so you can actually see how to measure this thing, okay? We're also gonna end up with an anterior orientation of the thorax because for me to have that posterior lower compression, I got all the other stuff laid on top of it. So I got dorsal rostral, I got pump handle down. Um, so again, I'm dealing with a lot of compressive strategy and the anterior orientation. So I've got an early uh, loss of shoulder flexion, but because of, the, of the, the orientation, I'm gonna hit that IR early and then I'm gonna run out of internal rotation very, very quickly. So again, I get this compressive strategy right at 90 degrees. So here's the solution. Number one, we wanna eliminate interference. So we're gonna avoid bilateral symmetrical exercises. So most of this stuff with a barbell in your hands is probably a bad idea. Anything that's considered a lat development exercise is probably a bad idea with an exception that I'm gonna talk about in a minute. So that takes chin ups and stuff like that off the table. Next step, restore the dynamic ISA. I have to have an ISA that can move so I know that I can recapture breathing excursion. We're gonna keep the activities in, in um, uh, below, rather, uh, 90 degrees of shoulder elevation. Because what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to capture that, that posterior lower expansion, but I don't wanna provoke in, any symptoms in the process. And so again, everything's gonna be below that shoulder level. The exception, might be that we can use a variation of a deep squat pull down. This might not be the first exercise of choice, but it might be something that we can go to because there's a turn that's associated with this. So once we drive something with a, with a reach below shoulder level or a supported activity below shoulder level, we may be able to access a higher level of flexion without any symptoms whatsoever. And especially in this deep squat where we're gonna get some of that posterior lower expansion in that position and then we can superimpose a turn. So we're actually gonna use the compensatory strategy that Mihail was talking about to our advantage. And we create that turn and we create a reciprocal expansion as we move one arm through the, the pull down um, at a time. And that's gonna give us the expansion that we want. So there you go. So there's your solution. This is for the Hawkins-Kennedy positive test. Okay, 
So let's go to the near uh, impingement test. So this is compression that occurs at about 120 degrees of elevation or higher. Okay, so a positive nearest test. So this is an upper dorsal rostral compressive problem. So we're talking about the spine of the scapula upward. Now, to get compression there, that means we've also got a pump handle that's probably gonna get compressed down. So let's move to our solutions. Number one, we want to eliminate interference. Heavy trapezius exercises will probably be off the table. We're probably going to have to lay off pressing, reaching, and, and pulling um, at 120 degrees or above because that's where our provocation is going to be. So this also takes bilateral ITs and Ys and PNF D2 flexions off the table as well as horizontal pressing. Now, we need a dynamic ISA like always, but here's the, kit, here's the kicker. I need to be able to capture an exhaled ISA. So to get uh, volume into the upper part of the thorax where I need the expansion to finish shoulder flexion without a compressive strategy, I have to be able to reclose the ISA into an exhale position and then inhale from that position with the expansion upward rather than expanding the ISA outward in a compensation. If I expand the ISA too much, then I don't have enough pressure to push the volume upward to create the expansion in the thorax. So make sure you can get an exhaled ISA. Um, because of the position of the, of the compression, we've got a lot of exercises um, that we can use now. So we can go prone and we can go support through the upper extremities in most cases. So we can start somewhere around the, the general vicinity of, of 90 degrees um, for a lot of these, these activities. And we're going to work on maintaining a, a yielding strategy in the dorsal rostral. We're going to drive the pump handle up and then we're going to progressively increase the degree of shoulder elevation in these exercises. So eventually what we're going to do is we're going to be able to work towards an inverted position in, in many of these cases um, to reintroduce the, the uh, higher reaching and to make sure that we've got the ability to close the ISA, I really like a reciprocal alternating pull down activity in standing that hopefully you can see right here. This is a nice little activity to reintroduce some of the resisted stuff. Um, it's very similar to the, to the squat variation that I talked about with the Hawkins-Kennedy impingement problem, but this is a nice way to reintroduce that. We can also superimpose some cervical rotation on top of that, which will actually improve our ability to expand the upper dorsal rostral area and finish off that flexion without the compressive strategy. Okay, impingement number three. So this is the, the classic painful art test. So this would be traditional shoulder abduction at 90 degrees and, and plus or minus about 30 or so and this is dorsal rostral compression um, from start to finish and so this is from about the spine of the scapula down downward and so number one we want to avoid anything that's going to compress that dorsal rostral layer so bilateral compressive exercises like like rowing bilateral eyes t's and y's bilateral face pulls off the table now you may be able to perform these unilaterally if if you can maintain a yielding strategy on the, the non-concentric overcoming side. So as I pull towards me this way, that's going to be the concentric overcoming. I got to capture a yielding strategy on this side. If you can do that, then you can do these activities unilaterally. But to do them bilaterally, it's a bad idea because all you're doing is compressing that area. Okay? Now, we still have all of our posterior yielding ex exercises that we can do. So again, we've got some of those prone variations, but one of my favorite things to do in this situation is um, go to my, uh, my Better Band Pull Apart video on YouTube or anything that couples the yielding strategy in the dorsal rostral area with shoulder external rotation. What happens under these circumstances is you're actually turning the scapula into what would be, I believe, traditional internal rotation of the scapula, which actually expands that dorsal rostral space um, to even a greater degree. Love those exercises for this situation. So this would be your typical painful arc strategy. So there you go. You've got three impingements, three strategies, three solutions.